Welcome back. This is Newsline. Now, this Thursday, President William Ruto will mark 100 days in office since he took office as President of the Republic of Kenya. He promised a different government. We'll be looking back at the 100 days of the Ruto presidency and asking ourselves whether he's on track to delivering on his campaign promises. Now, remember some of the things that were key in the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto. Five pillar, agriculture, universal health coverage, MSMEs, um, digital superhighway, and affordable housing. Which of those is the president's administration delivering on? Which of those is he finding a bit of a hard start to begin with? The cabinet secretary for ICT and digital economy, Eli Dowalo, was among the people who were working behind the scenes in the Kenya Kwanzaa campaigns, developing that manifesto, and now he is in the front row implementing it. He's our guest tonight, Waziri Karibusana. Thank you very much. It's good to have you on the show. Oh, yes. Now, the thing that we have to start on is the promises that William Ruto made yes. when he was campaigning. Yes. And he said, when I take over, I'm yes. going to deliver on this immediately. Yes. One of those things among the five pillars is yes. looking at the cost of living. Yes. And looking at the cost of uh, affordability of basic commodities. Yes. He immediately, when he was uh, sworn in, his first address was... I am going to approach it in a different way. Yes. Do away with subsidies at consumption. Yes. Introduce subsidies at production. Yes. Where are we on that? Well, we have made a fundamental progress. First of all, let me espouse the premise on the basis of which this pro proposition was, was made by His Excellency the President. Now, our cost of living constitutes, is considered by about 54% uh, the cost of, of, of food. Now, if you want to address the cost of uh, living, you start by putting money into agriculture because agriculture constitutes a substantial proportion of that cost of living. What have we done in agriculture uh, since we came into government? One, we have fundamentally reduced the cost of fertilizer from the initial 6,500 to 3,500 per 50 kilogram bag. Now, this is intended to reduce the overall cost of the production mm. because the cost of output is a function of the cost of the product, input. the input that go into the productive uh, processes. So that is one. Two, we have introduced uh, um, uh, input by way of seeds for farmers. This progressively actually will be escalated while we are moving into the period of the, of the long rains. Now, why are we doing this? We are doing this because, one, if we put money directly into the input processes of agricultural production, the end product, which is the cost of food, will go drastically down. And by extension, because food constitutes a substantial proportion of our overall cost of living index, the cost of living will, will go down. Mm. That is one. Uh, two, we are also looking at direct capital injection into the agricultural sector for purposes of creation of jobs. Agriculture constitutes 70% of the backbone of our economy. Mm -hmm. So the moment you put money into that sector, you are basically enhancing the base of the productive processes within the economy because agriculture also contributes towards the manufacturing sector of the Kenyan, the Kenyan economy. Yes. So what is going to happen is that the level of this possible, once you have got more people engaged in productive processes, creation of more jobs, you are enhancing the level of disposable income of the people. And in a nutshell, at the end of the day, we will have actually the affordability of basic commodities actually uh, becoming manageable. So is that what the president then said, that he'll need a year yeah. for us to actually realize the cost of living coming down? You see, you cannot do it overnight. We have actually, it takes, it, takes a, it takes a process. We have already initiated this process. It takes time from the time you come up with the deliberate intervention up to the time that you realize the results. What we do not want to do is knee-jerk interventions into the economy which are not what? Sustainable. Mm -hmm. If you want a sustainable way of reducing the cost of loving, living, put money into the productive sectors of the economy. Subsidize production. Yeah. Don't subsidize consumption because it is not sustainable. The question that many will have yeah. is, you know, when you talk about subsidizing, okay. it means that you're going to the market and buying at market price and then subsidizing it by 3,000 shillings. This is a 50 uh, kilogram bag of fertilizer. We are not saying that. Where is that 
3,000 shillings coming from and how much is it costing? You see, uh, subsidy is a direct interjection into the market where there are actually dis disproportionalities in the market. In a perfect market situation, you don't need to introduce any subsidy mm -hmm. because you leave prices to play out based on the forces of demand at what? Demand and, and supply. supply. Yeah. But where there is market failure, where there's disproportionality in the market, the government can come in by way of an intervention such as a subsidy in a critical sector of the economy, such as agriculture, because agriculture constitutes a substantial proportion of our, our, our cost of uh, living index. So how much has been set aside for this subsidy? How much money is actually going into making sure that farmers are getting fertilizer at 3,500 and seeds at a lower price? So far we have spent about 5 billion shillings in that capital injection. And how much going forward? Because there is an initial batch of fertilizer that, that was released. Yes. There is an extra batch that the president 1. said 4 million is, bags. is coming. Yes. An extra yes. 1.4 million bags that yeah. arrived this month. Yeah. And more to come by the yeah. end of the year. Yes. How much in total is being spent to make sure that farmers are getting the fertilizer at this lower price? We are, we are looking at a projection of about 20 billion Kenya shillings. This is in contrast to a situation where you are putting money as by way of subsidy into consumption, where so far we have spent about 160 billion shillings uh, in, in, in subsidy on, on consumption. So when we talk about now the, say, you said 15 billion? No, I've talked about 20 billion. 20, 20 billion shillings. Yes. That's going to be injected by the time we're getting to the end of the year. Yes. Into this. Yes. The... the question that is coming from many is that at the same time yeah. the price of commodities is still high yes. because what you're dealing with is with future uh, consumption so what do you tell people right now because the price of commodities is still rising what do they do about the current situation you see you cannot uh, reduce the price of commodities drastically overnight it has to be a process. It takes time from the time you put in interjections in the market up to the time of maturity. So we have to be patient. It is better to be patient and get sustainable results in the long run as opposed to knee-jerk reactions which are not going to be sustainable. What's the plan on uh, universal health care? What we intend to do there is to ensure that there is universal health care available to everybody. We have been witnessing a situation where the proportionate contribution of Kenyans towards the National Hospital Insurance Fund is tilted in disfavor of the people who are at the lowest uh, echelons of the economic pyramid. So what we are saying is that we need to have a situation where they, we restructure or re-engineer the contributing, contributions towards NHIF so that is based on ability to pay. If we do that, then we will have those who are at the upper echelons of the economic pyramid paying more. Yeah. Uh, while those who are earning less paying uh, something commensurate to their level of disposable income. So that, but at the end, tail end of it, we will have money available for everybody to enjoy universal uh, health care. Now, one of the interventions that we are introducing in that space is also to ensure mm -hmm. that we seal out some of the revenue leakages that we have witnessed within that sector, mostly related to entities like the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency. So we want to introduce a health management system yeah, that is anchored on technological capabilities so that we enhance the efficiency and effectiveness and strengthen the governance framework within the entire health sector. You know, just before um, we went to an election, yeah. the new NHIF Act yes. had already been brought into, into, uh, into play, yes. which had many of the amendments that you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. So how long before we start seeing the operationalization of the new NHIF Act? We are looking at this happening within the next year. Within the next first six months of the next year, we should be able to see fundamental uh, tangible results in that, these reforms. The other big one, of course, is when it comes to MSMEs, yes. the Hustler Fund was a major promise, yeah. 50 billion shillings to be set aside to support uh, micro and small uh, enterprises. So we have the first phase of the Hustler Fund that has been launched, yeah. which is just the personal loans. Yes. And the president has said that the second phase is coming come February. Yeah. Questions abound on what is currently being rolled out. Yes. On the legality of the structure of it. What's wrong with the structure? So number one, the, um, the, the 
regulations yes. that were gazetted yes. by the CS for the Nation, National Treasury yeah. said that the fund should be managed by a board. Yes. A board has not been gazetted. Yeah. The source of the fund is five. One, appropriation by Parliament. Yeah. Two and three is yeah. funds that are generated by the fund itself, either yeah. by uh, income from business and interest. Yeah. Four is funds that are, have been approved by the Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. And five yeah. is funds that have been donated as grants or as donations. Yes. Which of this is a source of the current money that's being disbursed? Over 10 billion shillings so far. You see, uh, uh, the, the, this fund is not just primarily supposed to be from, 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 from government. Looking into the future, we are going to have actually investors into this fund based on the viability. We have gotten already quite a bit of substantial injection into this fund from the private sector itself as we speak. So there is nothing that we have done which is contrary to the law. So the private sector that has injected money into this, has it lent money to the fund or has it donated money to the fund in the form of a grant? Or is it just a clean donation? You see, you can get into an arrangement as government where somebody puts in a direct capital injection and recoups it later when you have already regularized the formalities that you are talking about. So what I see is which is which? What's the source of the funds now? We have gotten this money from the private sector. At um, commercial rates? Is it a loan that has been lent to the, to the fund mm -hmm. to be repaid? Yes, we will give it back to the source of the money as we speak. What has happened is that because some of these processes were going to take long and we had got timelines to deal with, we got direct injection from the private sector and the agreement we have is that we are going to give back that money. Is there transparency on the source of the funds the contracts that have been signed in terms yeah. of the details, how much yeah. the fund will pay back to the person who's lent or the institution that has lent this money. We'll just basically give back what we have been given. There's no interest on it. So it's interest so it has, free it has, yeah, it, it has got no, just the same way you can give me a, a, a soft loan, Eric. Yeah? I can tell you that I envisage that I'll be having some substantial proportion of money at a given time and tell me, take this 100 million shillings, yeah? give it back to me after three months. That's the type of arrangement that we have gotten to as we sort out the regulatory issues around the fund. Okay. Yeah. Because we, we, did, we had actually made promises mm. to roll out the fund within a given period of time. Yeah. And we didn't want to let down the hustlers. Currently, who's managing this fund in the absence of a board? Yeah. The fund is actually uh, being managed by, 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 by the National Treasury, yeah, on behalf of the government. National Treasury oversees all resources or all funding uh, activities of the government. Now, without a board in place, there is nothing that is going to negate the operations of the fund so long as the National Treasury is there in place and overseeing the operations of the fund. But then what was the point of coming up with the regulations yeah. just before the rollout of the fund yeah. if the regulations were not going to be followed at the rollout of the fund? It's a question of the timelines that we were trying to beat. We are not saying that we are not going to set up the oversight board of the fund. It, that is work in progress. It's being done. But we have got timelines to meet as far as the rollout of the fund is concerned. The other aspect, of course, is the digital superhighway. Yes. Among the promises, and you are right there yeah. as the man who's implementing to deliver on that promise. Yeah. Now, there are very many things when people talk, think about digital superhighway. Yeah. The Jamhuri Day celebrations were anchored on innovation, ICT, yes. ICT yeah. and the conversation then has moved towards ICT yeah. on delivering on this. Yeah. But what exactly should we expect in the next, what should you have expected to receive the, by, the, by Thursday? And what should we expect to receive in the next one year in terms of digital superhighway? What's the plan? One, the digital superhighway is basically a deliberate intervention by government in our economic agenda because ICT is viewed both as a critical enabler, yeah, uh, and also uh, a success factor in everything that we are, we, are, we, are, we are trying to do. Within this ambit of the digital superhighway, we want to roll out fiber to the tune of 100,000 kilometers with a view to enhancing the level of ICT uh, infrastructure in the Kenyan economy. That, with effect, will enable us to, one, leverage on technology to enhance the level of internet access all over the country. Yeah? We are actually thinking of other than rolling out the 100,000 kilometers of fiber, we are thinking of establishing and operationalizing 25,000 internet uh, free Wi-Fi uh, hotspots and also setting up 1,450 digital village hubs. With that 
in critical infrastructure in place, we envisage that we are able, going to be able to digitize yeah, all government records and digitalize all government services within the next six months. As we speak, mm. we have got 350 government services about the e-citizen platform. We are at the tail end of negotiations to make the e-citizen platform a government entity and enhance its capacity so that we are able to onboard to the tune of 5,000 government services within the next six months. Once that is in place, then we can leverage on that platform plus the attendant services that shall have been onboarded to move away from the traditional way of doing business to also e-commerce. Make government operations paperless. We can also leverage on the existing infrastructure to ensure that, one, we enhance the level of digital literacy so that we have got a substantial proportion, if not all components of government employees being digitally empowered, members of the public, yeah, and critical sectors such as ministry, or the, the health sector, the teaching fraternity, and so on and so forth. If we have got a commensurate level of digital skills yeah, uh, aligned to the existing ICT infrastructure, then we can move to the next level of digital entrepreneurship where we can actually embark on manufacture of both software and hardware and position the country effectively as the ICT hub of Africa. Everything that you're saying, yes. Bonacias, yes. sounds very beautiful. Yes. It's music to the ears of many Kenyans. Yeah. But they look back yeah. at the various governments that we've had, yeah. administration after administration since Moi Kibaki, yeah. where this has been the talk. Yeah. The national fiber optic uh, backbone yeah. was rolled out under the Kibaki administration. Yeah. It seems to have stalled. Yeah. The Konza Technopolis yeah. rolled out seems to have stalled. The issue of digitizing services has started. It gets to a point, it seems to have stalled. The issue of harmonizing all data that government holds from the uh, land's office to the register of births and deaths to everybody else with a Huduma number starts stalled. What confidence do you have to give to Kenyans you know, today that this time everything that you've talked about can actually be realized? All this is, should be anchored on transformative, transformative leadership as an integral moderator. You cannot implement change programs in a vacuum. You need transformational leadership, a leadership that is able to see through the changes that you are going to introduce. Anytime you are introducing fundamental changes in any system, there will be resistance to change. There will also be lack of the will to implement the proposed programs, but it stems from the type of leadership that you have at the top. I can assure Kenyans that we have got the correct leadership at the top, a leadership that is a change agent, a leadership that is intentional on delivering services to the common monaiji. And we are very, very clear on the agenda that we have, and we are actually very focused on delivering on what we have promised. How many months down the road should we start seeing progress on this particular issue, the digital superhighway? Within the next six months, we shall have onboarded all government services. Um, six months? Yes, yes. yes. On board, we shall have onboarded all government services on a digital platform. We shall have digitized all government records. And I can assure you, we will be having a paperless government and Wanainchi will be able to transact business with the government from wherever they are, from the comfort of their houses. That would require Huduma It looks number. ambitious, but it is realistic, achievable, and attainable. It would require a Huduma number to be active. You see, don't be captive to Huduma number. What is Huduma number? It's, it's actually part and parcel of a digital identity that was envisaged. So we don't need to get stuck to the Duma number. What we need to do is to ensure that we have got a single digital identity that enables government to know who government is transacting business with. As we speak, we are already engaged uh, in consultations with an integral player in the private sector and within no time, based on best case practices which have been implemented elsewhere, we will be able to get a single digital identity and that will enable us have a situation where citizens can transact business with digital platforms. Within All right. Government. See, yes, let's stop governance. Yes. When the deputy president then yeah. was campaigning to be yeah. president, yeah. one of the things that he was very vehemently opposed to yeah. was talk of amending the constitution yeah. in 2021 or yeah. in 2020 or in 2022. Yeah. And he was saying that this attempt of a BBI was basically creating positions and offices for other people. Yeah. He has written a memo to the speakers of yeah. parliament yes. 
proposing to create offices. There's What's changed? S let me tell you, the, the operational environment is dynamic. Okay? Yeah. What has happened is that the, the, the president has given propositions to parliament. We know very well that the legislative arm of government is there, is, is parliament. It is not the executive. As, and when you want to introduce any changes or make suggestions uh, that will lead to any constitutional changes, those suggestions have to be made through the legislative arm of government. He has not coerced parliament to introduce those constitutional changes. He has just made suggestions. And one thing which is, we have been very clear about, and the president himself pronounced himself on this, is that the independence of the three arms of government will be upheld all the time. So we are not interfering with the independence of the legislature. No, he's just made propositions to parliament for purposes of consideration. They may accept those proposals and further the agenda forward, or they may say no, that this does not make sense. We leave that to parliament as an independent arm of government. So apart from just this one, the creation of an official office of the leader of official opposition, yeah. what other there's also the issue of main, mainstreaming the two-thirds gender, uh, gender proposition, yep. which to me is very, very positive. You remember this is an issue even which has been before the judiciary, before the courts, yep. and the court ruled that it has to be done progressively. In our belief, we have made deliberate efforts as government uh, under the guidance of His Excellency the President to ensure that we mainstream gender. Largely within the ambit of government, we are doing ab um, at worst about 40% in all government appointments as we speak. But we are envisaging a situation where we should actually meet the threshold as stipulated in our constitutional dispensation. When you have conversations with the president privately, because yeah. you know him privately, yeah. you worked for him yeah. as you were working for the campaign, yeah. do you raise the issues about, you're talking about parliament meeting the gender threshold, yeah. yet the shape of your own government has not met the gender threshold? Principal secretaries, cabinet secretaries, now we're going to have uh, chief administrative secretaries. We don't know. This is work in progress. This is work in progress. It, again, it cannot be not something that can be realized overnight. This issue has even been before the courts, and the courts rule that it is, can only be attained progressively. As government, first of all, even if you look at the appointments to cabinet, okay, cabinet level appointments, we are doing 40 to 60 percent. Of course, in favor of the male, but the, the, lady, the lady gender is at 40 percent as we speak cabinet level appointments. I'm not just talking about members of the cabinet, but cabinet level appointments. Which includes the other three positions of advisory. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, but, and that is positive considering where we are coming from. But the promise yeah. and the charter that was signed yeah. with the women leadership yeah. was for 50% 50, 50 of William Ruto's cabinet being women. Yeah. But progressively, we will get there. Or we're going to have cabinet reshuffles no no, no i'm not saying that we will what i'm talking about when we talk about government appointments it is just that the cabinet the cabinet is configured of so many components it is not just the cabinet alone so don't just look at the cabinet alone what i'm saying is that within cabinet we are at the level of 40 we have attained 40 percent threshold but in the entire ment, entire government if you look at the government in totality we are doing fairly, fairly well considered considered uh, compared to what other governments have actually uh, positive as far as gender uh, composition is concerned. I want to ask the final question and then we uh, yeah. conclude the conversation, yeah. which is what has emerged with the president and the kind of meetings that he's holding yeah. internationally, looking yeah. at the foreign policy yeah. and the foreign direction yeah. that the president has taken. Yeah. He has held meetings with the UK Prime Minister. Yeah. He has held meetings with the president of the USA. He yeah. has held meetings with the Prime Minister of Spain. Yeah. He's held leadership. Uh, he's, he's met with the leadership from the West. Yeah. And then he's gone to South Korea. Yeah. Now many are asking, is William Ruto shifting from the previous two, his two predecessors, from east back to west? No, 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 no. That's, I don't think there's going to be any rad radical shift in our foreign policy. What is happening is that the world has become one global marketplace while leveraging on, on, on technology. And you cannot implement your development agenda in a vacuum. As a country, there's nothing that we can do which is not aligned to what is happening elsewhere. Our global development agenda is today anchored on the sustainable uh, de development goals at continental level on the agenda 2063. Everything that we do must be aligned 
to the development propositions at those different levels. That then would entail a situation where you are constantly engaging with critical stakeholders within those segments. That is exactly what William Ruto is doing, that we have to hold constant consultations. We have to constantly analyze what's happening in the operational environment, look at the emerging issues, and then see how to respond to them. That requires 